So, I've actually got a few topics already selected from yesterday that people were giving me. And I have it set up so, just switch over to the classroom view. I have it set up so you can see both the YouTube chat and you can also see the classroom chat. So the four topics that I'm going to be covering initially today are going to be shading and coloring, spider anatomy, oddly enough, um, effects such as like explosions, clouds and stuff, which I actually can cover that in Flash as well because that's actually a great place to study it, and also the broad topic of how to progress as an artist. So I guess I'll we'll probably get started now. See here. Away! That's just great. All right, let me. See. Hello, my friends. So Courtney's also going to be here to help read off any questions that people have. Um, she can read the classroom chat, and she can also read the YouTube chat. So she'll cover anything that I miss. Anyway. Yay. Ooh. I will oh, be wait. paying attention to the classroom chat mostly. I was wondering why my tablet wasn't working, and then I realized I didn't even have a document open. <laughs> Alright. So, shading and coloring, stuff like that. I'm going to start with shading. Um, for those of you who caught the beginnings of the lesson yesterday, the thing that I had mentioned, or tried to mention before my internet cut out on me, was shading can kind of be broken up into three overarching um, portions, I guess. You have the mechanics of it, which is how something will physically like block light and where it goes. Um, you have kind of like the technique, which is like a matter of how the shadows diffuse and like, how to actually draw them and stuff like that. And there was one other element that I can't remember that I mentioned, but it was also important. I'm sure it'll come up. <laughs> so we'll kind of go as it goes. The thing to remember with shading is I'm going to start with the mechanical aspects of it, because that's the most important thing to kind of get started. So the key thing is to imagine all your objects as 3D. Say you have a circle, not a flat circle, actually a sphere. So this is like a ball. So you need to imagine that this actually will reflect light like a ball. When light shines on something, say you have a light source over in the corner here that's reflecting down like this, it's not going to just go like this. I mean, it can, but that's like, say this is more in the front. There's specific situations where it kind of go in the back, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't like just basically be a simple silhouette. So when you're talking about shadows, you also need to think about light. By the way, if anybody has any issues hearing me or understanding me, let me know immediately and I will adjust my volume settings. But anyway, so light will basically wind up hitting the front face. It kind of leaves a front face like that. Then you have a face that's completely hidden from the light. Like if you were to imagine this to be kind of like a cutout, anything beyond, like if the light is a single point, or completely distant point, these will almost be parallel. You basically have a cutout section that would basically be like a cross section. It'd block this out. And then this is where the shadow would go. And then you'd kind of have a focus point right here where this would be where the light is the strongest. So you'd kind of wind up with basically this. Shadows that kind of go like this. Oh, yeah, the other thing that was, I just remembered the last aspect. So there's the mechanical aspects like I'm covering now. There's the techniques, and then there's also the matter of color, which is surprisingly important. I'll cover that in a moment. So now, most objects aren't going to be simple circles, though. So what you want to do is you want to kind of try and visualize them as meshes that are comprised of a bunch of simple shapes, like a box. That's easy to shade, right? You have a light source that's overhead, kind of coming down on it. These would all be smooth sides, so they'd all have the exact same level of light. You wouldn't have like any smooth transition going from the top to the bottom. 
The most you might have would be something like ambience along the edges, but I'll cover that in a moment. Now for more complex objects, say we have a pear. I like pears because they remind me of butts. So say you have a pear, and you have light shining on it from... Courtney's internet just dropped out, so she'll be back in a moment. Worry that is for a second it was my internet. So say you have a light source that is behind the pair. Like if we were to kind of draw this out, it'd kind of be like this. Kind of give you an idea of what it is. So the light would be coming from this end. Probably put this on a separate layer so I can do this more times. The light's coming from this end, going this way, and it's going towards the camera. So you'd wind up with light going there, and then most of the item would basically be blocked off, like so. Most of this would be all dark. Because this is a round surface, however, different parts of it would wind up would wind up being different um, shadows, but if you're trying to do like cell shading, you'd kind of need to use what's called posterization, where you kind of choose like a set level where anything darker than this gets this level of shadow, anything lighter than this gets this level of shadow, etc. Cell shading is a little bit easier to kind of work with and draw, but yeah. If you want to do something that's um, more realistic, kind of just need to visualize out where... If you look at items in 3D, that'll probably help a whole lot. But just kind of, the key thing is just to remember how things operate in 3D space. Look at that pair of booty. Good booty. So as far as like, deciding whether to do highlights or shadows or whatnot. It's, again, it all kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, now let's try like a light source that's up front. That would mean a lot of refraction over here, and the hard shadows would be behind. And the key thing is just to, hello again, Courtney. The key thing is always just to kind of visualize it in 3D space. So, that covers, like, mechanics of shading, but how do you handle, like, approaches and stuff? I'm going to do a quick little outline, vector layer, so that way I can make quick selections. You don't have to use vector layers, I'm doing this for the sake of simplicity, sake of speed. So say this is my pair. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a color layer down here, pair green, because pairs are green. I lock the transparency. I'm going to make a new layer above this, and I'm going to set this to a clipping layer. Pretty much every single device will have a, every single um, program will have some form of clipping layers. Usually it's done via Control Alt G for the hotkey, but um, there's always usually a button for it. Basically what this means is It'll only use the alpha of the layer below it. So this line, for instance, that I'm going to draw in red, even though it goes all the way across this, if I set this as a clipping layer, it now only takes the alpha of the pair that I've drawn. This is very useful for making shadows. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to choose basically just a shadow color. I don't like using black unless I'm trying to be very dramatic or if I want something to look very muted. I generally like to do a slightly darker color, kind of grayed out, um, you can do literal colors, or you can do just like a generic darker color and then set it to multiply. I'll show how both of those look. I'm just going to start with a darker color for now. And cell shading. The way I kind of do this is you can kind of do it by drawing out the profile of the shadows, if you'd like. Or you can just kind of draw it in manually. Gently draw it in, etc. And again, you just have to remember, oh, hey, that's a shape. Where did this go? Etc. So say this is my pair. Looks okay. 
kind of assuming like light source like an example A. That's my pair. Now I'm going to show you what multiply does. Multiply basically changes it so however basically however much however darker there's basically two methods of two primary methods of, of darkness blending. Darken basically will use whichever of the two layers is darker than the other. So like in this case, if I were to draw something with yellow, it wouldn't show up because even though there's yellow here, if I set this to darken, it's only going to take the what's ever darker. Set it to multiply, however, it will show up because multiply basically takes whatever darkness is present in the color and adds that or subtracts it technically from the um, darkness on the layer below. I'm going to tint this a little bit, a little bit lighter, so it's a little bit less dramatic. So if you want to have more smooth shadows and stuff, you can then also use components such as like blending and blurring, things like that, or softer brushes. And you can basically kind of like draw it out hard first and then blend it afterwards. Or you can use like soft, you can use like soft brushes and kind of just do it manually. So you might decide that you want a little bit of blur and then a little bit of hard, like you wouldn't go all the way through. I kind of like that. The other thing you can also do, um, if you want a little bit more dynamic shading and stuff, you can even use different values for your shadows. Like say if I want this to be a little bit more dynamic, I might lock this layer lower my density a little bit so I can apply this a little softer then just kind of brush density So you can have like dynamics of the shadows. The other thing also to consider is highlights. Um, again, you can do highlights using normal layers, like so. And kind of just add a little bit of highlight where there's light, whatever. Or you can set them to overlay, and then they can override the shadows as well by what I call underlighting. That looks like a butt. Um, again, you can also do these using blurred or via solid. It all depends on what style you're going for. It doesn't really matter. But that's basically the mechanics of shading. Now, the thing when it comes to colors and shading, I'm going to reset this to one color. That actually looks better than it did before because for some reason, hairbrush is looking. Um, some mechanics you can do use stuff like radiance and stuff. Thing is, when it comes to shadows, as I mentioned, you don't usually want to have everything just be black. Like unless you're going for some really dramatic shading. I mean that doesn't look too bad, but I feel like but you can oftentimes do better. Like for instance, say it's in the afternoon. The shadows and the light are then going to come out very red. So like even though this is a very red color for the shadows, it still looks good. And then like for the highlights, you could do pink. And now it looks like this is a pair in the middle of a sunset, even though I didn't change any of the base colors. Um, playing with coloring stuff is basically you can do whatever like that. And if you want to look at what these look like, the layers themselves look like, you'll notice that the highlight layer, pink as is the shadow layer. So even though those are pink and normally you wouldn't expect shadows like this, like this actually looks still pretty good if you wanted to go for like some kind of neon style 80s coloring. When you set it to multiply, it winds up actually blending in pretty nicely. This should probably be set to overlay. Um, likewise, you can also do something similar if you want it to be kind of like muted or cold. There's blue shadows, and now it looks like an icy pair. 
So it all kind of depends on the environment that you're in. Usually for a lot of my character stuff, you might notice that I like to use like pinkish shadows. And that's just because they're kind of usually standalone portraits or something. I kind of want them to have that like soft aesthetic. But again, it all depends on what environment you're putting the items or the characters in. So just a little bit more of a shading example. Just so that way there's something more dynamic. I'm going to draw an arm here. I'm just going to draw like how I kind of utilize the shadows. Because, again, the key thing is you want to remember where the shadows go. Arm here. Okay, we got a light here. That means that it's going to kind of be... Light is basically going to be all around here and all along this side. Figure out where the light goes first, and then figure out where the shadows go. The shadows will go wherever the light doesn't. Kind of go like this. I'm kind of drawing slow right now just to kind of show precision. I cannot talk today. But if you know me, one other technique is try to be fast when you draw. Fast lines are good. Um, just some other random notes as well. We have an object, like a circle. Generally, I feel this is a bit easier to show. Like that already, like with a single stroke, I managed to make this circle look 3D. Thing to note is you'll have the light come down on this end. The darkest part of the shadow won't usually be at the very bottom because you'll have ambient lighting down here. The hardest part of the shadow will usually be kind of close to it, right here. And then it will be a smooth gradient usually for around objects. Um, again, if you're not doing like something more realistic and you want to do it more cel-shaded, you can do that. But sometimes you will still have a little bit of ambient lighting down there. So again, it all depends on what you're going for. But this is kind of just meant to be a general, quick overview of how shadows work. I hope that's helpful. Um, just a reminder as well, if anybody else has any questions in the YouTube chat, or especially in the classroom chat, feel free to just type them up. I will get to them as I go. Alrighty, what's next? Oh boy, Monster Girls. Okay, so somebody in particular wanted me to demonstrate how I draw monster girls again, and I actually did a tutorial on this before. So I'll do a tutorial on this again. They wanted me to cover the legs, and I also had people wanting me to cover kind of like the lower body. So I guess the first thing to learn how to draw is how to draw a spider, which simple, always think about things in simple shapes. Spider would basically be the thorax, and the abdomen. Those are the two core components. Then you have eyes here and then these. And then you have the legs all coming out over here, the body. So one thing you're gonna want to do is you're gonna want to make sure you also study pictures of spiders if you want to draw something like this because it will help you a lot. So the way I kind of draw a if you want to make a monster girl a spider, kind of do the girl part drew a draw a circle for the lower part or the lower waist and then I kind of morph the circle into the thorax and then I kind of just connect everything here and this basically gives me a weird hybrid between the thorax and the body someone has a question about shading oh what tool in I the usually YouTube use chat yeah I in can the see YouTube it. chat uh, I can see it um okay um, what tool I use, it, honestly, you can use any tool. I usually use the pen, the brush, or the airbrush. Anything will work. It, it all depends on whether you want hard shadows or if you want softer shadows. Um, you can also use the blend tools or the blur tools to get the same effect. Spiders. So... Yeah, the torso, have the thorax, 
And I kind of just... God, I got my groove thrown off. Sorry. That's eh, fine. Also, my mom keeps walking by, talking on the phone. Which isn't helping. So anyway, get the torso drawn up, and then I drew a lower part for the thorax. And for the, kind of like the pelvis area, I kind of like to draw these little weird parts, kind of like, some people don't like to do those. I personally like to do them. They're kind of like thighs. Kind of imagine them like being normal person thighs, like you do the hips, except put them as if they're sitting. Kind of do them like that. And got body. This is an oddly specific request, to be totally honest. I feel like I'm doing. I feel like I'm repeating myself because, like, I've covered this exact topic of before. And so let me just pull up the tutorial because that'll probably be better. Why is this in Cecil's folder? This should be in the tutorial folder. Alright, so I actually did a tutorial while in all this before. So what I do is I kind of start with like the head and torso like I normally would. And then I kind of draw the lower th thorax down here. And I kind of connect them in like a 90 degree angle. And I have the abdomen going over here. So walking through this all again. Head, torso, thorax, got the abdomen. Notice, kind of form a roughly 90 degree, but less line. For stuff like the legs, the thing to note about them is they basically come in multiple segments. This is actually something that you're really going to want to make sure you use references on. I'm only going to draw one leg, but then all of the legs wind up looking, they wind up being the same process. Kind of have like a little connection. This is actually, anatomically speaking, this is actually two parts, but I usually draw it as one. Then you have segment one, two, down a little bit so I can draw more. three, segment four. And spiders actually have all four of these segments. You can simplify it if you want. You don't need to have every single one. Like, let me see. Spider, Dante. Spider. Like Shantae, for instance, the Shantae games, they only have two segments for their spider form. They have this leg and this leg. Realistically, they're going to have four segments and they're going to have these little joint pieces between all of them. But it all depends on basically what you want to, how you basically want it, how detailed you want it to draw, be drawn, and how what kind of species you want to do. Segment one there. So, like for Cecil's case, I kind of have her legs a little bit thicker. She's loosely based off of a jumping spider. Kind of have a little bit more curvature. This is kind of basically how I do Cecil's legs. Big old segment right there. Spider legs. And then I basically just draw this again and again and again. The other thing you can also do, if you want to be cheap, copy, paste, view. Basically, just kind of attach the leg to a different spot. It's cheap, but it works. Works very well if you're doing vector layers as well. From whatever hidden behind the other legs. Two legs. And that's kind of the way you'd progress with that. So, any questions? I will give it a minute. People can ask stuff.
specific. Also, I will link the spider tutorial in this is uploaded. Hey, buddy. Yes, no. Remember touch your toes. Simon says, touch your toes. Touch your butt. I could do that one. Hell yeah. All right, and these tutorial, these lessons are really going all over the place. I might have to kind of set like a set theme for future lessons and kind of just go from there, so I can go into something more in depth or detailed, rather than kind of like covering a bunch of small topics, make everything kind of revolve around a singular topic. That might be better for flow too. Yeah. I'll decide after this one. Alrighty. So, next thing up. Um, somebody had a question about explosions, and I'm going to show how I animate explosions because I think that's animation kind of gives you a better appreciation and understanding for them. So, let me just kind of start with, I'll just start drawing something and then I'll just kind of describe what I did. And just start doing weird star shapes. So the key thing with explosions is to make sure that you're not like doing a consistent pattern. It should feel kind of random in terms of its distribution. Like balanced explosion looks Kind of like this, whereas a natural explosion look more like this. Parts that are kind of even and branching really bad. But like you can see, there's kind of like a bias to one side on this, and that basic this winds up looking a lot more natural than this. And that's basically the kind of the simple example. Fade out period here. Yeah, that kind of looks like a little burst. Fades out. Now for the now the cloud part of explosion, I kind of like to treat it as two different objects. So we've got kind of a cloud that kind of builds up around it. And then you just kind of build the cloud around the explosion and make sure that parts of the explosion stick out from the cloud. Once this cloud starts getting big, it'll start to dissipate and start getting weak. Start having it segment out. Puffs. Fade it away. Doesn't look too bad. So then, if you want to color this in, what I do from here, use a color for my fire, and I kind of start doing it very roughly. Keep in mind that if you want to draw a non-animated explosion, you do this pretty much the same process, just only do one step of it. Try to make it very sharp. I don't have to like stick to the uh, flexible. Bless you. 
Thanks. Kind of my first. Here. So that kind of shows like the higher part of a burst, basically just continually getting bigger and bigger, so shatters and pieces. Cloud part of the first. Draw this over top. Very sloppy with it. And again, I kind of have it grow out asynchronous, asynchronously. Like you can see that there's parts of it that's kind of like tilted one way or another. Segmenting. Nice, be rough as you want, or you can be sensual, sexy. So yeah, it's kind of like a little rough explosion. Kind of showing exactly the process that I actually use. Pivot animation. Um, other thing you can also do is you can also layer additional fire effects on top of things. You can kind of have like parts of the explosion coming out of the cloud. Or you can have other cloud pieces that are kind of on top of things. Kind of gives it a little bit of a 3D effect. So not just like thing. It all depends on what you want. And there we go. And that basically is kind of how you would get a little burst. Now, obviously, you probably wouldn't want the explosion to be red. Color this a more color.
the fire a little. Bigger. So yeah. Um, I'm going to actually that onto two. But easier to watch explode. Okay, let me turn it. So one other thing that you can also do is if you want to have some kind of shadows going on. Um, you can do that. I like to do this. Brush both of these as my colors, and I'm just kind of lock in a few ch shadow chunks. Select what I just made. Kind of add the highlights, and just kind of do like these weird circular shapes like this. And it winds up actually adding a whole lot. Like this actually looks suddenly very 3D, despite it being such a simple little stupid drawing. Otherwise, I'm going to do the same thing here. Just draw a few dark chunks for the shadows. Chisel those back. Create a little. Also, do this by reverse where you highlight out the um, do the light portions. I'll actually do the section, but basically, just my explosions are basically just a combo with a bunch of circular shapes. Basically, how I do my explosion clouds, about how you draw realistic clouds, but it's a good way to draw explosions. And if you think about it, it reminds me of yellow pudding. So this one, I'm going to color this way first. So if it's all dark, highlights. And again, going back to the shading thing, just think about the amorphous 3D shape that these clouds take. Think of it as a bunch of spheres that have all been merged together, or a bunch of circles. Figure out where the top is. Like the highlights. Keep in mind as well, this is also a very quick and dirty example that this isn't just like this isn't a um, holistic example. But um, I can show a few examples that I made when I was making the ride. Kind of give it a bit, little bit more of a demonstration breakdown. So yeah, that's how you kind of get a 3D effect with the shadows. That's kind of like how I animate my explosions. You can also have that one. Yeah, that's kind of a quick and dirty way to do shadows animated or explosions animated. Um, a similar process would wind up applying with non-animated art. So 
shouldn't be too hard to transfer over from that, especially considering that 2D art programs have much better tools. Like, instead of having to use the selection option on the brush here, I could just... Here, I wanted to do a pink and black explosion. Draw the black, off the transparency, and I can just go from there. I don't have to select anything. Ah, it's a bubblegum explosion. So just to go over some other explosions that I've done. Little effects reel. Yeah, fire. Here's an explosion that has like a little buildup, kind of an anime style one. You notice, first frame, it's kind of a circle that kind of focuses down. Got these light shafts that are coming off of it and spinning around it. The circle in the center is getting smaller and smaller, and it kind of slows down a little bit. You can see it goes from ones, twos, to threes, to fours. Flickers really quick. And I have the burst and cloud layers. Burst in the cloud layers. I actually let me color these different colors. Recognize them. I did this entirely white, so the so the verse is a little bit um, sloppier. As you can see, it goes like got the burst on top, the cloud on the bottom. Burst is getting bigger. Burst is getting bigger, cloud is getting much bigger. The cloud kind of separates out and disperses, as well as the burst kind of becomes just a little bit of fire. Sparks that kind of dissipate really quick. Clouds get really big. It's like a huge buildup explosion. It's another little burst that I did that I really. This was based off of um, Boku no Hero. This is actually done with a few tweens. Got break it down. Got this burst layer here, which this is actually a nested animation. It's actually shaped tweens, and it's broken shaped tweens because you can see here these are actually fragmenting. Normally, it's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to just scale, but in this case, it actually worked to my advantage. And then I have the glow layer in the center, which basically gets big. The whole screen. That bursts up. Basically makes the flash. And these are just little smoke effects that kind of branch off of the thing. These are really simple tweens. Little easy. Got the spark. Here is another nested animation. It's just these little wing things flying out of the center. Floppy. I would have blurred him if I had thought about it. Perfect. That'd be interesting and relevant. Gunfire. Those will only play back during um, a few impact effects. Again, just first, yeah, kind of like a solid cloud little thing here instead. That's just a single piece. Kind of relevant. Charge in for the laser, light shafts, just literally just a block and a sphere that oscillate in size. That's about it. And here's the fiery explosion that I made. I actually like. Over here I have a little bit of an implosion where you have these little flecks of fire that are stacking up. They become these little gelatinous pieces at the burst. Layers of fire. Again, it's actually four layers in this game. Um,
But yeah, this is the backing layer, backing clouds, and then I got two layers of whatnot first. Yeah, the smoke is honestly the sloppiest thing on that. That's about it. Okay, anyway. So, I have 42 minutes so far. So the last item that I kind of wanted to talk about was this overarching idea of artistic progression. And it's a important concept to note because a lot of people, they kind of get caught up on, like, details of, like, when you want to advance through art, you want to try and cover many, many different bases, basically. So, like, one thing I always state is focusing on speed. And the reason why I say to focus on speed is because this basically allows you to cover as many different bases as possible. There are aspects such as, like, understanding detail. There's, like, detail-oriented things. There's technique-oriented things. There is um, color theory. There is composition theory. There are um, characterization and style influences, anatomy studies, stuff like that. Um, quality and control, stuff like that as well. Like, simple thing is when you're drawing a line, the reason why I say to draw lines fast is because when you draw a slow line, I'm trying to make a straight line here. But you'll see. This is not a straight line. But if I go fast because I'm confident, that's a pretty fucking straight line and it's nice and smooth and everything. And this was a lot faster to draw than this. So now imagine doing this, making this comparison for every single line on every single stroke of a character you make. If you can draw quickly, it really will help you get your stuff done and it will help it make it look better. So that's why I am so insistent that efficiency is important. Um, it's also a matter, part of it's also a matter of muscle memory, like just learning how to do the same thing multiple times over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, making sure that you can get it consistent. So what you're going to want to try and do, the key thing is you don't want to study on just one thing. A lot of things will kind of come naturally as you work on other aspects of art. So when you're doing gesture sketches, for instance, and you're doing like pose maniacs, and you're drawing like your character models and stuff, doing your weird poses and things, that's giving you understandings of perception, or not perception, perspective, anatomy, efficiency, and posing. And those are basically four really important elements and stuff. Most people think like, oh, it's just helping me out with my anatomy. It's like it's helping you out with so much more. And the key thing is to try and focus on things that give you a better understanding of many things. Um, other things to note as well is some people like have this idea and this perception that artistically realism is some kind of goal. And it's actually not. Realism is a style, so you can make it a goal of yours. But realism ultimately should be seen as a style choice, not as a level of mastery. Drawing realism isn't easy, and it definitely can demonstrate mastery, but you don't have to feel pressured that that's where you have to wind up. All artists have different purposes that they want to strive to and different goals that they want to meet. So you don't need to draw realistic if, you don't, if that's not what you want to do and what you intend to do. I personally am a cartoonist. I can do realism if I want. I don't enjoy it though, so I don't do it. I focus on studying things that make me faster, study things on making my stuff more expressive, things like that. Focus on composition, dynamic posing. The key thing is just trying to basically master all these different facets of art. There is a um, tutorial, I'm trying to see if I can find the um, person who made this. I believe his name is Nizio, or Enzio. And I'm actually just going to put this up here because this is, explains it really well. This kind of basically gives a little bit of an overview of various facets of art. And he kind of shows how 
there are like he defines them into four categories the advanced studies application general practices and prerequisites and the prerequisites would be the stuff that's more of like the technique ability the stuff that you need to kind of be able to control yourself the general practice would be more of like the basics and stuff the advanced studies would be things like um stuff that you more think about with animation such as like framing and organization um, as well as stuff like anatomy and life drawing and then the application that's something that i focus on a lot is basically doing stuff quickly and efficiently as well as like cultivating he also includes style in there and as he meant as i mentioned earlier he also kind of demonstrates how study i'll actually see if i can get a link to this and include it in the description but he kind of demonstrates how like when you're at a level he kind of classifies them into levels for art so you have like level zero which is where you're basically just getting us basically learning the basics and stuff learning how to do stuff repetitiously learning how to do stuff accurately and basically kind of start get your line control down etc then as you advance you start implementing stuff like perception silhouettes body proportions anatomy things like that and as you go on further and further you'll notice that like like down at the bottom at the higher levels and stuff you'll notice that you still have some of the basics included in there like he still has the techniques and the orientation and the framing and these are all like really basic things yet these are still included in the higher levels of mastery degree because you're basically constantly learning things i'm probably probably sounds like i'm rambling at this point but i don't know it's this is a really broad topic so i'm not really trying to cover every every single aspect of it and if i wanted to do like a series on this i'd have to cover basically one facet at a time and spend like 30 minutes to an hour on each facet but just to kind of give a little bit of an overview this kind of shows like how progression winds up working in, in particular um you can see here kind of shows like a level zero where you're just kind of starting out drawing and stuff and this kind of looks like what you might have drawn when you were like 12 or so or when you first picked up a pen etc and you can see it's front framing and stuff so that way it's symmetrical and it's a little bit easier to draw um very simplistic there's not really any perspective or 3d to it as you can see in mastery level one you start getting a little bit better grasp of anatomy it's still in the front pose because they're afraid to kind of experiment with 3d and stuff but you can see that there is a clear improvement the second mastery it's kind of a little bit stylized and you can tell that it's very heavily influenced by the style but they finally decided to branch out and start making stuff that's 3d the one thing i would say that's a little bit ahead of the mastery is that in particular the feet are actually really goddamn good on this like um just in terms of the framing and the angle um it's still a very stock pose and a very simple one that doesn't really push any boundaries you might also see stuff like this where the hands are behind the back from here at the third mastery things start to get start noticing a lot more detail and stuff like there's more full there's now 3d folds in the um curtain stuff the pose is a little bit more dynamic it's still a pretty safe pose to draw but it's something that's a little bit more interesting then we start getting into more diverse stuff where like at the fourth mastery the poses are more dynamic and they're more characterized and then the fifth mastery showing an example of perspective as well so you got dynamic posing then you got dynamic perspective and then you have attentions to anatomic detail on the very last put in the sixth mastery and beyond and this basically keeps going and going in this case this was going more the realism route but as i pointed out you don't have to go down realism you can go down whatever you want you can go down uh, style is as i've mentioned many times style is basically how anatomy is simplified or represented it's not a replacement for anatomy so it's kind of a summary of i guess breakdown of that tutorial and i'll and again i'll try to find a source to his original stuff so that way you guys can read it in full and you can dissect it because it's a very very good demonstration and it really encompasses a lot of artistic learning aspects but i guess next time i think that otherwise about wraps up this lesson 
think what I'll do next time is I will have my patrons decide on a singular topic and then try to grab ideas and discussions relating to that topic. And I'll cover one thing at a time. So that way it'll be a little bit more organized because today's lesson was kind of all over the place, I'll admit. I mean, we had shading and coloring, we had spider girls and monster anatomy, we had explosion effects and animation effects, and then a discussion of something that's very broad and very important. But anyway, thank you guys for watching it. And I'm sorry that there weren't more questions for you to help me with Courtney. That's I okay. I hope it didn't feel awkward. Um, you're good. Your homework for this, your guys' homework for today, this week, this month, um, draw butts. Touch a butt. Touch a butt, then draw it. Study draw, the butt. Study, like, go up there, just grab the butt, get a good feel of it, understand every curvature of the anatomy. I want a fully shaded butt that explodes <laughs> on my desk <laughs> by next month. Wait, do you want the picture to explode, or do you want the, the drawing I like, want, having I want, an explosion in it? I want the drawing having the butt to explode. I want the butt to be shaded. I want, specifically, I want it to be a spider butt, and I want it to explode. Grab a, gr grab a butt, and then imagine it as a spider butt, and then make it explode. That, that's, that's your guys' homework. <laughs> I just realized I forgot to change the topic on the um, little text thing on the screen. Oh well. Whatever. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Goodbye, everybody.